All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out. Uh, and apologies, there's a little delay, of, as is, uh, happens with these things. But we're going to go pretty fast. Uh, we have a lot to go over, thanks to, in no part to our silicon, uh, our silicon uh, vendors, our supply chain, or uh, DHL. Uh, but yeah, we're excited to talk about behind the badge and a little bit on how we use and abuse hardware to create the uh, ADSB receiver on a badge for the aerospace motions here. My name is Adam Batori. This is uh, Robert Bafford. And let's get into it. So we start off with uh, some theory and some practice. But the theory of the badge is uh, when, yeah. The idea we had for the badge uh, is actually one that the Aerospace Village has had kind of in the back pocket for a while, which is, could, would, wouldn't it be so uh, super cool to do an ADSB receiver on a badge, fully integrated, uh, and able to run without needing a network connection from a service like, you know, FlightAware or, or anything that feeds community crowdsourced ADSB. So for those of you that might not be aware, ADSB is or uh, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast is a protocol, and it's a type of signal that's a very important aspect of aviation safety. It is transmitted between airplanes, between ground stations, and in some cases even uh, uh, with satellites that can uh, transmit a whole host of messages between um, different stations. The most relevant for us uh, are things like call signs, flight numbers, AKO addresses, um, altitude, headings, so information about planes that you can see flying overhead. And while it's uh, intended uses for safety and uh, air traffic control, a common uh, hobbyist and enthusiast use case is that it's just cool to be able to see uh, a map of all the planes and aircraft around you overhead and be able to see what flight number it is, it's heading, where it's going, flight plans. And ADSB itself can exist over multiple types of data links, but when we say ADSB, the most common uh, physical medium that it's sent over is the MODES downlink at 1090 megahertz. And if you want uh, more information on ADSB, what it's used for, uh, aeros uh, talk about aerospace motion. <laughs> um, but where we come in as like hardware design and badge designers is how do we actually, we have the signal, we know what we want to receive, but how do we actually implement and uh, make a badge that can receive this signal? So the most common like enthusiast receivers utilize SDRs or software defined radios like the RTL SDR. And because this was designed a long time ago, the protocol and the modulation is actually fairly simple to uh, demodulate and decode. It's on off keyed, which is effectively digital amplitude modulation. It's either on or off. You're either getting RF or you are not on the 1090 megahertz. And the data bits themselves are Manchester encoded, meaning that the data exists in the transitions between one and zero or zero and one. Now, to do this on a badge, if you want to do a so-called real SDR receiver, uh, the chips that are required for that is expensive. They are like very high-end RF chipsets and is way too, uh, way too expensive to put on a badge. <laughs> um, think of something like a, uh, like a hyper app, for example, as a proper SDR. The SDRs, like the RTL SDR, uses a DVB-T, which is a digital terrestrial broadcast television. Uh, and they overdrive those chips to run faster than they're intended to, which lets you get into that 1090 megahertz band and then receive it and decode it in software. One of the issues that uh, we found when we started looking into using one of these DVB-T tuner chips ourselves, though, is that they are very power hungry. They are very power hungry, especially when, um, especially when being overdriven to hit the 1090 megahertz band. And in addition to just getting really, really hot, the battery life of the badge would be next to zero. So we had to come up with a new way to do it. And the third major way of receiving ADSB is the log amp architecture. This uses a very fast RF power uh, level meter, which converts the logarithmic received RF power into a linear output voltage. And in this mode, it can act as an envelope detector uh, when filtered with some very tight 1090 megahertz saw filters. So, uh, the way that the architecture, the receive chain works, is that from you, you get the entire, you get the entire uh, RF spectrum coming in through your antenna, that gets amplified and filtered and amplified and filtered again through very tight 1090 megahertz bandpass filters, so we can extract only the very specific slice of the spectrum that is centered at 1090 megahertz, and then because the signal that we are trying to demodulate is just on and off the RF power meter will let us know, is, is it seeing 
no RF, or is it seeing more RF? And that lets us turn the 1090 megahertz um, ADSB packets in the air into a uh, two, mega, two megahertz uh, baseband level uh, output. And we actually used a, uh, an amplifier and anti-aliasing filter chip from a composite video signal, from a uh, composite video receiver, because it is very cheap. If you want to use, if you want to buy a, you know, an eighth order Butterworth filter with uh, multiple channels and power amplifiers and clamp diodes, well, analog devices would love to charge you a lot of money for that. But if you want the, if you want, no, I mean, no one uses composite video anymore, right? But if you want this composite video amplifier with an eighth order Butterworth filter encoded, uh, filter implemented into it and multiple uh, chains and an amplifier, well, you know, please take it. Like, who uses composite video? But the last step in this process is digitizing the signal itself. We, again, the common way of doing it is to put it into a fast uh, analog to digital converter, an ADC. But again, high performance RF, uh, RF intended ADCs are expensive. And uh, when trying to optimize uh, design, the best chip is no chip. So the SOC that we're using for the main Linux component of the badge is the all winner T113. It has dual uh, Cortex A7s, and we'll get into the, some more of the specs a little bit later. But it doesn't have any fast ADCs on board, at least not, nothing that's actually fast enough to demodulate ADSB. Well, it is intended actually for automotive video applications. So it has multiple video inputs and outputs. And one of the uh, supported video uh, input modes is composite video. Well, if you know your composite video trivia, the baseband signal has uh, frequency components that require at least a 27 mega sample ADC. And sure enough, if you look at the block diagram we have in our data sheet, it says that uh, in, on the left side in the P, next to the PGA is an ADC block because that you must have a fast ADC to be able to digitize composite video. And it's a fast ADC, but it's, uh, if I actually go back, you can see there's, it's pretty, the, the ADC is not isolated. It's wrapped inside a bunch of uh, filters. You have the PGA, you have the, all the hardware blocks that are designed to demodulate composite video. So you don't get raw samples from the ADC, you get pixels, basically. So it tries to find a lock, it tries to find H-Sync, it tries to find V-Sync. It has built-in filters to do color, uh, color correction, which means that as it, as it stands, it could not receive ADSB, it couldn't actually get you samples because it would just always say, oh, I can't find a signal, I can't see a video signal, and just do nothing. But the ADC itself is in the silicon. And as we like to say, we paid for the whole silicon and we want to use the whole silicon. And well, we had to do some reverse engineering on how to be able to disable these filters. And we were able to discover certain undocumented registers that <laughs> some undocumented registers in the all winner chip itself that let you put it into this special manufacturing test mode. See, making fast ADCs, the reason it's expensive in isolation is that it's kind of hard to fabricate and then verify the harmonic performance of. So the manufacturer, the silicon manufacturer will put in these modes that let you basically bypass out the, R the actual like video, the H-Sync, V-Sync blocks, because those will probably work but the ADC itself can then be isolated in the special test mode, which can get you the true raw samples up. And then when you have the true raw samples, you can verify the performance. So that's exactly what we want to be able to abuse this as a standalone, straightforward ADC. And uh, that's exactly what we did. We did some reverse engineering. We found the registers. And when we put it into this test mode, as you can see from the trace, that is pulled, uh, pulled from a badge with the RF, uh, RF front end attached, that is the, AD, the ADSB preamble and the start of a data packet being received as raw samples from the onboard ADC. And actually, I will go back. You see the preamble uh, pattern, the 101101, and that's exactly what we're seeing on the output of our ADC. And this was our proof of concept to say that, okay, we can actually do this we can get away with not using any external ADC or SDR chips or really anything intended to be used in this way, except like the saw filters, and do it fully integrated on just the uh, core Linux SOC. Now, uh, 
as I said, the specs of the badge itself, outside of just the RF, we are running full mainline Linux 6.6. Uh, we thought it'd be really cool to bring basically a Linux dev kit on a board. And since we have the power of the of our SOC to do the RFD coding, and we have to write a bunch of software to manage the Wi-Fi and everything, we're like, hey, instead of writing all the drivers ourselves, uh, mainline Linux is out there and it's great. Let's use it. Our display is a 40 by 40 circular display, which we got uh, custom manufactured for us. The two, yes. A lot of people actually thought it's like, it's not a smartwatch screen. It is, I don't, we actually don't really know where it's from, but we, we, uh, our, when our display uh, manufacturer said, hey guys, we have these like cool, uh, we have the circular displays you're talking about and like this 2.7 inch uh, form factor, what do you think? We're like, this is perfect. It looks like, it looks like a radar scope. It looks like an oscilloscope. Let's go. Outside of the ADC, on the core uh, T113 SOC itself, we have the dual core A7s so running at 1.2 gigahertz each. Uh, and that's the application processor uh, cluster that is running Linux. And then another bonus that we get on our silicon is the Hi-5.4 DSP, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more in, a, in um, a few slides. But that's a DSP core that's designed to be an audio coprocessor that we are, again, reprogramming outside the manufacturer's use case to actually do the demodulation, Manchester decode, and ADSB uh, bit slicing. In the package, in the package, we have embedded uh, 120 megs of DDR3 SD RAM, eight gigabytes of eMMC onboard storage, and some uh, other tri uh, RF implementations. We have GPS and Wi-Fi, because why not? We're already going all out. We're already doing full custom RF and uh, uh, printed PCB antennas. Like, what's like? Let's go for broke. Let's add GPS. Let's add Wi-Fi. Okay. So no, that's no. all. Yeah, that's all in theory. We uh, before that, I think there's a badge. Giveaway that's gonna. Yeah. No? Okay. I'll keep going. Okay. Okay. So um, now this is all what we had in theory. This is what came up with the designs, and then we get it manufactured by our manufacturer, and then uh, they come back, and now we actually get to implement it and go through all the crazy uh, systems and actually do the reverse engineering and make sure that we can actually get this ADSB receiver running inside of this badge. So you'd think the most challenging part of this whole design process would be the fully custom ADSB receiver running like with an ADC and an undocumented test mode and then piping it into an audio DSP, which was never designed with the goal of actually doing ADSB decoding. But that was actually the easiest part. We had a um, the RF, it, Adam being a uh, mad lad, made a full zero to tri-band microwave RF in just four months. Uh, this is his first RF project. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And then the uh, TV decoder code, we got it working after a night of debugging, and we actually had a cool oscilloscope uh, mode that uh, we could actually read directly from the ADCN and get it plotted on our screen. And then we got a um, DSP code execution in a week, and then after that we did a week for Linux kernel dev, and then a week for algorithms, and we got ADSP. That was the easy part. It was everything else that should have just worked that didn't. Uh, mainly of which, if any of you guys have ever worked with USB-C before, can probably understand why it's USB-C. And then, of course, the AXP2585 battery management chip, which we will go into more detail later about the whole experience with that. So um, before we get into the uh, more challenging parts, uh, here's a quick guide on um, running code on your hi fi 4 DSP. Um, so the all winner T113, it has a hi fi 4 DSP, and they advertise it as, oh, you have a third core. But what they don't tell you is that they only give you the firmware is it like a blob that gets loaded in and it's only for audio processing because it has an audio out and it does all the codecs with that. Um, and the mainline kernel doesn't even have, it doesn't even touch the DSP. But it is its own CPU core. It can be programmed. And if you find the right resources, you can actually program it. Because we're doing all of these ADSB um, processing, we want to try and get the maximum performance to get as high speed out as possible so we can increase the sample rate and a better performance. So we wanted to do the full um, SIMD vectorization and actually use the real hi fi 4 uh, tool chain from the vendor rather than using a lot of like the open source ones you might find with ESP32 running with GCC. So if you find the extensive tool chain, which needs to, um, then you need to, uh, you get the extensive tool chain and compiler with the vendor tools, but you also need to actually get the custom vendor um, IP block, which was used to generate that exact silicon. The great part about uh, Hi-Fi 4 is it can be exactly customized to the exact chip you want to build. 
So if you want to have all of these advanced vector units, you can add them in. If not, you can remove them. You can have however many registers you want. And it's all configurable to the silicon vendor, but that means that the compiler needs to know what it has available. And the way they do that is a full blob, which has full Verilog for the chip that actually gets produced as just a giant zip file, and you load it all into the tool chain, and it figures out how to program for your chip. So once you find that, then you have to compare that with the exact version of the Extensa tool chain that um, it was built with. And then you have to locate all the drivers from all winter and source them and gather them up to actually do the interrupt controller, timers, mailbox. And then you just download the free RTOS port from GitHub. And you combine them all together. And you can actually get actually one of the most stable development environments we've had on this entire badge, where you just run Extended Explorer and it just works. So that's kind of the process for getting DSP. Um, and now, um, actually, for Linux on the badge, we are, again, we mentioned we're using mainline Linux, um, and that actually drastically sped up the dev time, where you don't have to do, uh, a lot of the drivers came pre-baked, you just have to configure them correctly. It just works. But um, you have to figure out how to configure it, so a lot of the time it's finding magical incantations and device trees that you forget to set, that cause it to panic, all of that. And then if you put all the things together and you figure out that it should be working, but it's not, then it's a bug, and then you spend three weeks doing advanced kernel debugging, figuring out why your display is not working. Speaking of which, display trivia. Take a guess. Which of these four options caused the artifacting? Of the clock being messed up, you have too large of a back porch, the, there is an unknown silicon bug that only happens when a Linux driver sets an undocumented bit, which just ha happens to exist in a sister chip, but is not on our system on chip. Or the display controller registers were initialized in the wrong order, but they never tell you the right order. <laughs> the answer is E. You didn't seat the cable properly when you're trying to solve all the other previous ones, and you're trying to debug the issues above. This is the silicon bug. <laughs> So this was uh, just a fun thing of we spent three weeks trying to solve this silicon bug right here uh, where it actually the display would turn green and it was because they were setting some, uh, the driver for the sister chip had a bit which they were setting but it caused the, uh, the, this chip to glitch in a weird way causing the MSB of that green channel to be set high but it only occurred on this one and you have to go through all 10,000 lines of the display driver and find the exact line you have to comment out which caused the display not to turn green. But if you do that, then you have a working screen. So here's a continuation of the meme. Um, the AXP2585 has been the thing that has been battling us and fighting us for the entire badge. Um, so this chip, it's just a uh, USB-C negotiator, battery charger, BMU all-in-one. It's actually a very unique chip because there's not that many that do all of these. A lot of the time you have to get several chips and stitch them together. So there's no firmware, it's not like some embedded 80, 81 core, or, uh, yeah, 8051 core, all that. It's just basic I squared C registers you need to configure. How difficult could it be to program? It's just flip-flops, right? There were several bugs that we found in the AXP2585, um, and all of them battled us throughout development. From the first bring up, we've had battery detection, which says it should try and detect if there's a battery and not try and charge it if it doesn't see one. But they say it should always try and do that by default, but all of the chips we get actually are cleared and they assume a battery is present, causing weird instability until you program it in the bootloader and in Linux. There's also fun things where if you get power or any sort of hardware glitches, it causes very undefined results in the silicon, where certain registers stop working or things stop writing. Um, there's also the joys of USB Type-C where we learned that if you plug it into certain model MacBooks, instead of the MacBook charging the badge, the badge will try to charge the MacBook, which does not work. <laughs> and um, there's also uh, the biggest thing that actually delayed us a lot right at DEF CON when we were trying to solve this, and we spent um, a big part of the time when we were trying to get things ready, trying to debug why the actual IRQ pin to, to interrupt the Linux kernel and say data is available, actually not being um, going low. And this was all due to a certain manufacturing issue. It was not actually a bug in the chip or a configuration issue, but one of the pins was not soldered correctly by the board manufacturer. It passed all visual inspection, but it was the one of the ground pins was not soldered well enough, and it got just enough of a ground pin connection through the other ground pad that it worked enough, but not enough to have a bunch of weird glitches and voltage dropping out and weird chip instability. So we have probably, this AXP2585, it's a great chip for like the cost and everything, but it's the true cost for this chip is really in the development hours of 
all these bugs trying to solve the USB-C issues and bring up and try and figure out why the chip isn't booting. But if we, if we wrangled it enough to actually get the badge running and we have a stable system, just make sure you have a battery in when booting up because BMU Gremlins will come up without it because of instabilities. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, yeah. All right. All right. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining us for this overview. I know it's, uh, as you could see, we've been battling gremlins for untold amount of time. So everything is a little bit rushed, but we have zero minutes. So if you have any questions, uh, we, we will be more than happy to chat after uh, either here at the village. Basically, you can come find us. We'd love to chat some more. And, uh, and yeah, if, uh, if you have a badge out there, tag us on the... Uh, on the aerospace aerospace village Twitter, we'd love to see uh, where they travel to and what planes they're picking up. And uh, with that, thank you.